Look at him. Just look at him. He's waiting for something bad it's to like, happen. I know something's up. Yeah. And his opponent's going to play a Tarmogoyf and he's going to be really happy. But it's a really good matchup for Tron. I, I, yeah, I mean, if you want to put a percentage on I feel like you're like 75% to win. I think your match was really good. And especially if you take a look at Gabriel Nichols' sideboard, doesn't have very much hate against the deck as we are underway here in game number one of round number nine. So Ursa's tower into a chromatic sphere. Yeah, uh... He does not look happy <laughs> when when Joe played the Urza's Tower, yeah, too. I, I wouldn't be too thrilled. It's a very difficult matchup here for Nichols. Joe going to cash that in, likely for a green mana. See what he finds. See if he's able to assemble Tron on turn three. Uh-huh. Power plant strategy. He's close. Well, this is interesting because he didn't he didn't scrying, he didn't stirrings, he didn't play another star or sphere or anything. Ex Expedition map, nothing which means he probably has another Tron piece in his hand. Well, it didn't look like he had seven cards to start. Fair enough. Fair enough. Blood Crypt is what Nichols is going to search up. So Nichols will fall down to 19. So... The way that Jund typically wins this matchup is a quick Tarmogoyf backed up by some disruption and, you know, just a, a little a little bit of stumbling on the Tron player's part, basically. Yep. Either them not assembling Tron or maybe, you know, you ghost quarter to take them off a piece or something. Uh, but if, if both decks play out naturally, the Jund deck is just not going to win. They can Inquisition a piece. Now, here is Joe's hand. You see two Pyroclasms, an Oblivion Stone, two Grove of the Burn Willows and a Ghost Quarter. So he did have seven to start. Yeah. It's kind of a weak hand. I mean, in theory, he has, he has two of the Tron pieces and at least two ways to buy time. Pyroclasms definitely count. And then the O-Stone, you know, maybe it counts somewhere down the line. If you have two Pyroclasms to slow him down, maybe the O-Stone is actually live by then. But, yeah, I don't know. How do, you, how do you feel about hands like that generally? I, I think I would keep that hand a pretty high percentage of the time. I'm not in love with it, but I think I would keep it. I, I, I keep some pretty loose ones with Tron. You have to keep some pretty loose hands with this deck. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, say you're in Joe's spot and you think that Nick Miller's out to get him. <laughs> <laughs> what? Then, then I might walk in. <laughs> no, no, because then, then you're just like trying to figure out what sort of weirdo deck your opponent could be playing, right? Yeah. If, if he thinks that we are trying to set him up. Yeah. I love that the set you up narrative is part of the match for Joe. It, what, it do might, do? what are you guys doing to me? It might be. I don't know. We didn't do anything. We just paired you in a match and put you on camera because you're playing for day two and we haven't seen you all weekend. That's all. I saw him play a Grove of the Burn Wolves before passing the turn back. The Dark Confidant strategy. Not going to be too effective against the two Pyroclasms. Spell's got the draw here for Joe. He's got a couple of those in the main deck this weekend, two of them. Yeah. I think that's kind of standard at this point. Pyroclasm going to take care of Dark Confidant. A second to play a Ghost Quarter. See if he wants to cast Spell Sky this turn or not. It appears that he does, and he will. Now pass the turn back. He's holding another Tron piece in his hand. Burden Catacombs to draw here for Nicholas. So picks up the third land. Unsure what he can actually do in this spot, though. As I said earlier, Tarmogoyf is probably the best card. Uh, he does have a Tastiger. That might count. Basically a Tarmogoyf. Yeah. That's an Overgrown Tomb. A little bit more damage, but that doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah, Tron tends to win pretty big. Very rarely does it come down to, like, nickel and diming you out, you know? It's more like you have no permanence and they have seven giant planeswalkers or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Seven might be a stretch, but... Yeah, we find a way. Here's Liliana speaking of planeswalkers. So if Gabriel can get this up to six before Joe draws, you know, Tron piece and action, might be in a reasonable spot. Liliana's up to four. Lissette has drawn... Tron's online. That's the mine. He just has nothing to do as far as the payoff is concerned. So Liliana's going to get to hang around for a little while. Okay, so Gabriel basically needs two more turns. You know, take up a Liliana twice, and then you can ultimate Liliana, maybe take Joe off Tron, and that'll give you some breathing room. Maybe this Tasker can close the game out. 
He also has an abrupt decay or a terminate to clear the way. Yep. Make sure there are no spell sky chump blocks. It's time to delve. So here's Tassiger. Got your clock now. And Liliana going to work as well. Up to five. Abrupt decay is a discard to go on Pyroclasm. All right. We'll settle draw. Big spell? Nope. Just Nurse's piece. Another power plant. Mismatching Tron lands. Uh, yeah. For shame. Yeah. I, I've, grown, I've grown accustomed to Joe's loose ways with his lands. <laughs> First the white bordered lands. No, those, those I understand. You know, he started playing in Revised. He wants the nostalgia. Yeah. I get that. I mean, I've embraced what Joe does with his lands. He's going to discard one of them now and now get hit by a Tassiger. <laughs> and that is, what, I assume that's a mine. Oh, uh, uh, that, is, that is a mine. Yes. Okay. Or excuse me, that's a power plant. Pardon okay, me, power sure. Plant. Yep. One of each picture, why not? Trust me, it's a power plant. Boom. But what he does have is he has Tron on line. He's empty-handed Liliana on six. I need a big draw step here. It looks like he might be ghost quartering himself. Yeah, I mean, if, if you need a big draw step, you might as well thin your deck. It's a little aggressive, I think. Yeah, I mean, Gabriel did just play a Raging Ravine, and maybe you need the Ghost Corner to take that out. You know, yeah. it's, it's possible that he might draw one of his two Ugins and then want to protect it. Come on, Joe, look at the top card of your deck. Ah, come on. No fun. Who doesn't look? See, and there it is. The, the whiteboard and land makes it easier for him to search for it, and he's separating the Tron lands for us. So it's, you know, his lands make sense. Big draw step coming. A lot of redraws. This is actually, this is a weird thing to say. This is one of my favorite spots with Tron. Well, you're a psychopath, yeah. <laughs> which is why you play this deck, and yeah. this is certainly one of the reasons why. Anything can happen. Chromatic Sphere. I just want there to be a sweat. Oh, Worm Coil Engine. Fine. Yeah. Duh. Anything can happen. Perfect draw. Your turn. I just want a sweat. Why couldn't it be a Chromatic Sphere? Yeah, he could have drawn a land, but there aren't that many of those in the deck. So instead, Worm Coil oh, Engine. Big thing. Yep. That's what it's all about. Could have been Ugin. Well, Ugin just clears the board and then gets attacked by the Ravine. Yeah, killed by Raging Ravine, yeah. So, at best, you're at parity. All right, cash it in. Time to split them up. Let's take a look here. So, there, there's another power plant in the graveyard. So, if you split, like, power plants and forest versus the other two Tron pieces, I think that kind of makes sense. Yeah, you want to knock them off power plants as best you can. Yeah. But I don't know what you do with this Worm Coil engine, because even if Joe has to sacrifice it, it's not that big of a loss. Yeah, he still gets the two three threes. So you have to be pretty careful about how you do separate this if you're Gabriel. I think you have to separate power plants. Yeah, I think you have to put power plants together. Right. With any pile that you make. Yeah, I don't really want to split the mine and the tower. I want to keep those together. Making, making four piles. Is that keeping Tron? I think you put Tron all in one pile. I would keep that and yeah. then make two three threes. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily mind having to clean up the three threes at the end, but I would definitely not want to let my opponent keep Tron. I, yeah, I don't want him to keep Tron. Like, if he has a Maelstrom Pulse in his hand, this this is acceptable. But I don't want him to. I don't want to just give him Tron. It now, like his deck is still turned on. Well, you, even if you had Pulse, you're still better off not having him have Tron, right? Like, that's yeah. the reason you ultimate the Liliana is to get him off Tron. Yeah. Here comes Raging Ravine. It'll get a counter. I think I might be okay with taking this hit. Yeah, because if you keep the Death Touch Worm around, you, in order for Gabriel to trade the Ravine for it, he has to invest another turn. So that's going to take a look to see what's in the graveyard. <laughs> All right, looks like they're going to trade. Now here comes Karn Liberated. Yeah, probably. Oh, looks like a Tron piece. I think it was a tower. I do just want to play that, yeah. I want to have access to as much mana as possible in case I work into a situation where I start chaining together chrome stars and chrome spheres and stuff like that. That is true. I mean, there's 
the argument that maybe our opponent draws a Thoughtseize or something and then we'll cast it. There's also the Tectonic Edge that's lurking in Gabriel's deck. Yep. Which is now turned on. Now, most people play Ghost Quarter, so I don't fault Joe for playing the land there. But it's just one of those things where if Gabriel draws that, that's a pretty big deal. You yep. know, that's a game changer. Stopping ground off the Verdant Catacombs. We'll see what the draw step is here for Nichols in just a moment. Interesting game, but we've had so many interesting ones here this week. Yeah, this is this is definitely another one of them. Nichols will draw. Tasker's coming. Lissette's taken, falling down at 12. And that's a Tarmogoyf. That's a big one. Especially when you're playing Astronic, because there's going to be an artifact in the graveyard. Ancient Stirring is a draw. Yes, yeah, so this is a big deal, too, because it allows the Tasker to actually get in for damage. Otherwise, you're basically trading one for three. Yep. Let's see what this is. I'm going to check the size on Tarmogoyf. There's... Planeswalker artifact. So yeah, that it's, it's already huge. pretty big. Not surprised me to be a 6 7. Yeah, it is. Maybe this a Liliana? Jeez. Yep, now make a sacrifice the lifelinker. Here's an attack for 10, puts you down to 2. And now Julius has got to draw a green source, be able to cast Stirrings, and Carnine is going to help him. That's a green card. And that's going to do it. Gabriel Nicholas is going to win game number one here against Joe Lissette. Jund up a game over Green Red Tron. Yeah, that's what I said. You know, you need the Tron deck to stumble. Either they don't have Tron and can't cast their spells, or they do have Tron and you just need to have them not draw good spells. Yeah, and you can see Joe's a little bit frustrated about that loss. Was not able to cobble together the necessary tools to get the job done. And, you know, he's also in a, what many consider to be a good matchup for his deck. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I play John and Tron is the deck, even if I have the full set of Fulminator Mages and two Ghost Quarters main deck, it still just feels impossible. It can be tough. We'll take a look at the sideboards here for each player. We'll start with Lissette, who's got a Spell Sky and Ancient Grudge. Three Nature's Claim, two Thragtus, two Rending Volley, three Relic Progenitus, two Crucible of Worlds, and a Ghost Quarter. I really like the Crucible of Worlds. If you're in Joe's seat, you have to anticipate some amount of land destruction coming in. And if your opponent doesn't have lane instruction, then whatever. You know, you get to play your game. Uh, and also, if, you know, your opponent has Liliana the Veil ticking up, you can just discard lands and replay them through the Crucible. Uh, other than that, I like the Threg Tusks. Yeah, in this matchup, back when I was playing Tron a bunch, I would typically just board in the fourth Warm Coil engine and board out my Emrakul and just call it a day. I didn't want to change very much and dilute the deck. But also, that was a time when Relic of Regenitus was much better against them. Joe mm -hmm. has his Relics in the board. Relic is a little worse against them because they don't Deathrite Shaman anymore. Uh, I, I can get behind this Crucible plan and just boarding out uh, a couple copies of Spellskite because I don't think sure. they're particularly good. I mean, I could also see... Well, he has, he has the Pyroclasms, which killed Dark Confidant and not much else. Yep. Uh, so maybe he does want to bring in the Relics to be good against Tarmogoyf. So okay. that he could potentially Pyroclasm them away if he has to keep in Pyroclasm. Sure. And then those threat toss, maybe those come and maybe those don't. But on the other side of things here for Gabriel, he's got a Duress, an Abrupt Decay, an Ancient Grudge, a Feed the Clan, an Anger of the Gods, a Hunt Match of the Fells, a Shatterstorm, and then two ofs and Fulminator Mage, Kitchen Finks, Leyline of the Void, and Knight of Souls Betrayal. Uh, well, Fulminator Mage is the first card I think that Gabriel is going to bring in. Uh, past that, he has some things that he can bring in. Things like Kitchen Finks, Huntmaster, they're a little bit resilient. Uh, they're slightly better threats against things like Karn that uh, either make two bodies or, like, in Finks' case, is not good against Karn, but is good against, like, the Pyroclasm type stuff. Like, you basically just need to make sure that you are attacking the Tron deck at all points in the game. And so, to that end, you need to be kind of threat heavy. Uh, so even though things like Finks and Huntmaster might not impress in the matchup, they are better than these removal spells that otherwise don't do very much. So uh, Abrupt Decay, if you're on the play, can snipe an Expedition map, so I kind of like that. But uh, Terminate is not that great against them. I generally just keep in, like, the Kologon's Commands and Maelstrom Pulses to clean up the Warm Coil Engine tokens, and uh, I like the Ancient Grudge for doing that too. Well, there are your options there for both players. And now game number two will be underway here in just a bit. We'll talk the Season 4 schedule here on the Open Series right now as we're about halfway through this thing. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Atlanta. Last weekend, we were in St. Louis where we saw Tom the Boss Ross get the job done. And we're here this weekend in Dallas for a little modern action. 
Well, crowd champion here. Someone's walking out of here with $5,000, 25 Open Series points, and invite to our Season 4 Invitational. Next weekend, Philadelphia is where the Open Series will stop with Patrick Sullivan and Matthias Hunt. And then we'll have a sealed Grand Prix in Atlanta. StarCityGames.com slash GP Atlanta for more information about that. An Open Series in Kansas City. And then we'll go to New Jersey, the worst state in the country, <laughs> for legacy action. I'll be joined by Patrick Sullivan, New Jersey's own piece of garbage. And then we'll do an open series in Denver, and then we'll do a season four invitational. He can't. He can't do anything. He's is, not here. I was gonna say he is can't there, is do this anything. Just the check to see if he's watching. Yeah, he can't do anything. It feels so good. Standard and modern invitational with a standard top eight, and then the standard open series, December 11th through the 13th, Las Vegas, our Players Championship in Roanoke, Virginia, December 19th through the 20th. Myself, Patrick, and Matthias Hunt will be bringing you the final tournament of the year where Brad Nelson is defending champion, Jacob Wilson, Ali Trazi, and a bevy of other players are going to be there. It's going to be a lot of fun. And it looks like right now Joe Lissette will probably be headed that way as well. Man, what do you say when I'm not here? you got to watch and find out. I, I watch most times. got to watch and find out. I could say anything. Sometimes I'm competing in tournaments. Well, that's true. That's true. Got to get your Twitter followers to get after you. I'm mm, have people on the hunt. Yeah. It's mostly New Jersey related beats. Okay. I mean, I can I can deal with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of on your side on this one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Patrick. <laughs> but your main selling point are the diners you have. Just saying. He's very passionate about New Jersey diners. Is it? It's not even Harold's, right? It's just diners in general? Just in, in a general sense, diners. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's weird. I guess they have great diners. The New Jersey people are going to come after me soon on Twitter, but that's fine. Cedric, what does Ohio have? What don't we have? Specifically, Strong Town. We have, we have everything. <laughs> we have it all. We've got the best basketball team in the country. We have great colleges like The Ohio State University. We have lakes that light on fire. We have so much stuff. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What is this fire lake? You don't know about that? No. Yeah, like the... Uh, like, like, it's, it's a, I think it's a Cuyahoga River. Uh, it lit on fire, like, in, I don't know, like a couple decades ago. <laughs> okay. There's, like, a lot of oil in it. It just lit on fire. Just Google it, man. It's just part, right. it's just part right. of the ambiance of being from Ohio. You just embrace it. Once again, player Michael I don't think it was Lake Erie. I think it was the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga River. Ohio also has vermilion. Yeah, there's a lot of great things. A lot of great food. I'm from there. There's a lot to like. Is that, is that a plus or a minus? That's up to you. Urs is mine. Is uh, Joe's first land. Ancient stirring, sylvan scrying, Emrakul, Grove of the Burn Willows, and another land here. Ghost Quarter. It's a GQ, yes. Oh, okay. Fun fact. We've just been told. Uh, apparently 13 fires have been reported on the Cuyahoga River. So it's not really a one-time thing. So I imagine, you know... It, with that many, you would think that I would have heard of it, but past, like, the fifth one, it's probably not big news anymore. No, not, not so much, but... It's, it's just kind of like that lake is on fire. But where that do, river. Where do you know where a lake can just light on fire that many times? You're from Minnesota, the land of a thousand lakes. Ten thousand, actually. Sure. A lot of lakes. And a land of a lot of lakes. They're just... They're not actually lakes. They're all frozen over. Yeah, so it's, it, it's the opposite of yeah, Ohio. And none of them light on fire, so there's nothing special about where you're from. Where I'm from, our lakes light on fire. Or rivers. Or they're constantly burning. We haven't figured out correct, yet. Correct, correct. It's just a great place to be. Anyway, there's an ancient stirrings. Well, yeah, this is, <laughs> that's an expedition map for Joe. Now, Joe did keep his seven cards, I believe. And, you know, like, I don't like the Ember Cool in this matchup very much. I don't think it's necessary to win. I think if you are able to put together two Warm Coil engines, it's far too difficult for Jen to win. Yeah, I mean, the, the Ember Cool is there for Eye of Ugin, right? But if you're, if, if you're activating Eye of Ugin, then, yeah, you can just get Warm Coil and probably kill them anyway. Yeah. And Joe, Joe kept six, but I just don't think that Emrakul should be in the deck after sideboard. I've been pretty passionate about this. I, yeah, and Emrakul is just not a good natural draw. I have lost a game once where my opponent killed all four of my Warm Coil engines. It's happened approximately one time in my history of Tron. Well, and I lost. <laughs> and I lost because of it. Gabriel's hand does have a Shatterstorm. It's going to take a little more than that. Here's Expedition Map. Going to activate that. Joe's going to search up a land. Well, maybe he'll just task her it back <laughs> seven yeah, times. Just keep doing it. That tasker is not attacking. It's just, re <laughs> it's it just is. recasting Shatterstorm. Well, you have four Worm Coil engines, <laughs> sure. so you're at 40 life. Sure. And Joe going to search up an Ursus Power Plant. Last one to find is the tower here for Lissette. We're going to head back Gabriel's way. And I like using the map. Uh, Joe 
drew a Sylvan Scrying for the turn, so he could have cast that, but then that kind of exposes the map to any sort of removal spell. You want to do it now. You don't want your map to get abrupt decayed or Ancient Grudge or any of that nonsense. And also, you want to do it when your opponent's a little low on mana, because you never know if Shadow Doubt's coming. And it only takes that first Shadow of Doubt to ruin your entire life. I, I guess I just haven't been hit by a, a really good Shadow of yeah, Doubt. Yeah, it only takes know? one. Emrakul, well, I guess it's good here. It shrinks the Tarmogoyf a little bit. Yep. Not that there's a Tarmogoyf in play or anything. Yes. You can discard that, shuffle a couple of cards back. Yeah. And then maybe draw it again. Are you excited? <laughs> yeah. So we have a thing here that's a G Live where Progenitus always jumps to the top of the deck, mostly for Ross Mario. Yep, yep, yep. So we'll perhaps find if that happens for Joe with an Emrakul top deck here, using the term top deck loosely. I think Ross has told me about the times he's drawn Progenitus as many times as he's drawn Progenitus. Yeah, it happens a lot. Ooh, a Tower of Power. Oh, natural. It's time to cash in a Chrome Star, I believe, for Mr. Lissette. See what he can find. There are some good ones to draw. And he has access to eight mana. Joe's kind of explaining exactly what I'm doing here. For those of you who've never played against Tron before, the power plant's going to tap for two. You minus one to cast the star, and then use the one mana floating to cycle the star and still have a mana floating, which is a green in most instances. Now he's able to tap the other two Ursus lands for five mana. That'll make it six. Grove is seven. Karn costs seven. Convenient. It's weird how that works. Yeah, and now Karn Liberated is here. One of these Planeswalkers is better than the other. So what do you like? Do you like up or down? I like uh, I, I like down in this instance because I want to get Liliana, Liliana off the battlefield. And my creature's not in, my creature cannot be attacked by, or my Planeswalker can't be attacked by Raging Ravine. So I'd want to do that. I'm opening myself up to Lightning Bolt, but I want to make sure I get some value out of my card. Yeah, Lightning Bolt is a card that I initially thought was not very good against Tron from the Jun side of things. No, it's good. Oh, it, no, it absolutely is. Like, not only does it close out the game, but there are situations like this that happen where it's like, okay, Karn killed your thing, but now you can bolt it to get the Karn off the table, and then maybe they don't have another big thing as a follow-up. Yeah. Uh, so I am kind of worried about that from the Tron side of things, where I think you could tick up and not have too many terrible things happen to you. Now, Gabriel has the, the Maelstrom Pulse lurking, so yeah. it, it kind of ends up the same thing. But the, the, the bigger concern I would have in that situation is just I don't want Liliana on the battlefield. Like, if, I, if my Karn gets pulsed, then I still have to beat Liliana. Sure. And I don't want to have to deal with that. Okay, that makes sense. I kind of panic with Liliana being out there. I, 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 I find it unpleasant to play against. It's another Planeswalker strategy. Ugin. Upstairs. This would go up. Yeah, I don't want to go down. I want to go, I want to go up with this one. And that's exactly what Joe's going to do. It's up to nine now. Now, this card, like, Karn is really good against Jun, but it's not the end-all, be-all. Like, th there are plenty of situations like we just saw where it dies. But Ugin, Ugin is really hard for this deck to beat. Abrupt Decay falls a little short. With, True. Which was Gabriel's draw step. True. Tarmogoyf's not really going to get to be able to do its thing here unless Joe, I guess, lets it do its thing. Yeah. I would probably just minus two. Yeah, they're finding out the sizing, but it's not really going to matter. It's going to get exiled. Yeah, no matter what, it's just kill that thing. Just exile the Tarmogoyf. Don't worry about it. And see, this is this is more of what Tron does. Like, in the last game we watched, Joe had some difficulties. He wasn't able to find the, the right top decks at the right time. But when Tron is able to do this, Jun's draw steps are very limited, and you really get to flex your muscles. And this is... Ugin is a card that was printed after I stopped playing Tron. So yeah. I never really have got to actually use this card in the deck before. Yeah, it's it's more of the stuff that you want against Jun, certainly. Yeah. Ancient Grudge the draw. And you see where Gabriel's deck is kind of disjointed at this point, because these are cards that you want to have in your deck for certain situations, like Decay can kill Expedition Map, or half of a Worm Coil Engine, that's useful. Uh, sometimes actually killing a Chromatic Star or Chromatic Sphere is actually pretty nice. Shatterstorm can clean up one half or, or the second half of a Worm Coil Engine. And Ancient Grudge is actually pretty good in the matchup too, but it's all, the cards are all really sensitive on timing. And right now, these are the worst possible draw steps. Yeah, and you also don't want to draw too many of them. Yeah. So right now, things look horrible for Gabriel, where maybe in other circumstances, they actually look pretty good. If, if Gabriel had a Kolagon's command there, it would have been very good, because yep. he could have taken out the, the Eye of Ugin when it was still in Joe's hand. Mm -hmm. Joe's going to play the Eye. <laughs> Yeah, check his sideboard, see what he's got left over there to search for. Oh, well, we know he has the Emrakul, and it's it's close to getting to be that time. He's got access to 11 mana as far as the Emrakul count is concerned. Tron, uh, Emrakul count is concerned, excuse me. Tron's seven, Ivugan is two, that's nine. The other two lands are 
10 and 11. Joe with, I believe, a tower in hand, so he has a theoretical 14. Yeah, so it looks like just worm coil engine time now, right? Uh, that is, that's my preference. I could see getting a spell sky if you really want to protect Ugin, if those were still in his deck. Yeah, sure. But I guess if your opponent is playing Jund and they're just sitting on a bunch of cards, it's probably pretty likely the spell sky will die anyway. Yeah. That looks like Asian Stirrings was the draw. Yeah, so his, his deck is just humming at this point. You know, he's got everything online. And it's just very unlikely he can lose from this point. Well, it's there's it's basically impossible to lose from this point. Uh, I, I don't even know what the series of cards that Gabriel could draw here. You know, some people would say, you know, Sewing Salt could be it out in this situation. But if Joe leaves his Ghost Quarter up the entire time, Sewing Salt isn't even a thing. Yeah. So. Okay, so do you like the extra Ghost Quarter out of the board? Not only does it prevent from stuff like that happening, but killing Raging Ravine is kind of a thing against the Planeswalkers? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of... Like, I, I know that Joe has the second Ghost Quarter in the board. Uh, I used to just start two. Yeah, he brought it in. He yeah. just found it off Ancient Stirrings. Yeah, I'm, fi I'm fine with that. Ugin's going to move up. To 11. And then, do you want to just get another use out of your Eye of Ugin? Because he could just cast Worm Coil, but it seems like it's probably just going to get destroyed by some means, right? You know, your Jund opponent has not played any cards in a while. If I have Emrakul in my in my deck right now, which Joe does, then I would just I would play the Tower because I know that I have access to Mana Number Fifteen with a Ghost Quarter, mm -hmm. and I would just I would just search for for Ugin for, or, or for, for Emrakul. Yeah. yeah. I guess like if you do it this way, this is a minor thing, but you do pick up a little bit of info. Sure, yeah, you see that your opponent has brought in Ancient Grudge rather than just conceding Demrical. Yeah, you know, maybe you get the info. Maybe this information that you pick up on your way out the door is pretty useful. Like, if if Gabriel were to cast Shatterstorm this turn, be like, okay, like, these are these annoying things that he has to yep. deal with. So by doing things this way, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, if you're, if you're just looking for the cleanest path to victory, I think using the eye an extra turn is probably the best way to go. Yeah. But this might be good. I mean, like, he has 23 minutes left for game three. That should be enough time for the stack. I can't imagine a game dragging on much longer than that. The matchup typically does not take very long from either side. Here's Abrupt Decay. You get to find out that he left in at least one copy of this card, which is kind of nice to know. Lissette has not used his Ugin just yet. Seven mana, looks like he's gonna activate I, two, three, four. Let's see what he's searching for. Oh, okay, so he's gonna go this route. I think I think he just might, we'll take a look at Ugin really quickly. I think he's just gonna put it on the battlefield. Yeah. Gain seven, draw seven, then puts up to seven permanent cards from your hand on the battlefield. Yeah, so he's gonna do it this way. See, I've never done this before because I did not play Tron once Ugin was released. Can he just put in like <laughs> six Tron lands and cast it? <laughs> that would be cool. All right, Ugin Ultimate. You have to admire Gabriel's ability just to play on here. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe he wants the info, too. Fair enough. Joe has found seven permanents. Four, five, six, seven. Ooh, there's a Karn in there. That's fun. <laughs> For who? Oh, fun is a zero-sum game. Oblivion Stone, Emrakul, Karn. A chromatic sphere? No! You don't leave now! All right, Gabriel's going to concede. There's only 20 minutes left, man. That's true. Got to try to get this. Oh, I've seen number. enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. Joe Lissette going to tie things up here. Green Retron, Jun, getting ready here for game number three with day two on the line. Gabriel immediately reached for a Shatterstorm and put it on the table face down. I believe that, really? yeah, I believe okay. that card's getting sided out. Okay, fair enough. It, it's, I think Shatterstorm is, is not going to do very much. It's not going to do really what you want to do. Also, it's very expensive. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there, there are spots where these cards can be good. It's just so tough, and you can't have too many of them in your deck at the same time. No, I'm not entirely sure what he's going to want to bring back in. I do like discard in this matchup a pretty healthy amount. Um, you know, there are spots where it's good. There are spots where it's bad. Tron is a good deck that's really built and geared towards top decking because of Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star, stuff like that. But I think he's maybe wants to bring in maybe a Duress. Um, Full yeah, Air Mages are clearly in his deck after side. I, I am scared of the Planeswalkers first and foremost. Yeah. Like, Worm Coil is no picnic to deal with when you don't have Path to Exile, but between Kolagon's Command and maybe some amount of Terminates, Mails from Pulses, Ancient Grudge, like, he has ways to fight through it. Uh, Liliana, too. You know, there's no good clean answer, but that is beatable. 
yeah, it's not pleasant, but right. it's beatable. It's really typically what I found when you're on the Tron side of things is that Jund will have to go through a, I'll say a few hoops, but they can they can get by the first worm coil. It's a second one. They're just like I don't have the resources anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm spent yeah. at this point. Yeah, that that's typically what happens, and and most of the time Dark Confidant isn't involved. So, I'll see how Gabriel does sideboard here, and you see the two players chatting it up a little bit as game number three will be underway here in just a moment. In the meantime, we're going to learn a little bit more about Joe Lissette, the California native who doesn't spend a lot of time in California, apparently. He, he, we see him so much here in the Open Series. He's kind of old. He streams. He likes miracles. <laughs> 36 years old from Redlands, California. One Invitational Top 8, our Season 1 Invitational last year in the Open Series. 17 Open Series Top 8s with five wins, most of them coming in standard, four of them, and then one of them in Legacy with Miracles. Varsity Rower, the University of Colorado, a Star Wars fanatic, so he's probably thrilled with the new trailers that have been coming out. And he does follow StarCraft II as closely as he follows Magic. I knew the Varsity Rower thing, too, because it was Magic Online's green name. Um, don't tell me. Hold on. Oh, come on. I know. Oh, this is embarrassing. And I, I only say <sighs> old by Magic player standards. What's the screen name on Magical Line? This is embarrassing. You just give up? I can't remember. I'm not going to be able to remember. Like, when you try to think of something really hard, and then you, you don't remember then when you do that. It's really not that hard. It's, it's the Oars Man. That's it. Thank you. Oarsman 86, I think? 76, maybe. 76, 70, 79. 79. Yeah, we were, 79. we were close. Yeah. Oarsman numbers. Yeah. That's, that's how I refer to that. It's been bad. I, uh, I'm sorry, Joe. He's probably going to go back and watch this and be mad at me. He's definitely going to watch. He's definitely going to be mad at you. Maybe not for this. Maybe for something else. OK, fair <laughs> enough. Maybe multiple things. Who knows? He's too nice to be Yeah, mad. he is. I was going to say, he's like an even keel dude, you know? Yeah. You could be bad mouth in his home state, probably, and he'd be like, yeah, it's fine. Well, California's great. They have an out burger. Why would I say anything bad? Is that his home state? I'm not even sure. I think so. Not positive. But that's, that's where he currently lives. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like you can talk some smack about Washington. I wouldn't get that upset at you, you know? I've only lived there for two years. But Washington's great. Why would yeah, I? I, I know that you wouldn't. Yeah. Why would I only talk smack about one place, and it's horrible. And it's Jersey. Yeah. Okay. That's the one. But see, also, for what it's worth, as Joe's going to take Mulligan here, Patrick talks garbage about places too, mostly Philadelphia. So he picks on places as well. I'm not alone in this. That's not a state, though. That's not the point. That's not the point. It's a place. Okay. It's a place. He's very anti-Philadelphia. So that you're aware, everyone at home, our, uh, our zoo player here, he's 9-0. Stephen Long giving a epic beating. 18 land. That's so few lands. That's so few lands. I think we're going to have him the sideboard. That just means you draw more Kurt Apes and Goblin Guides. That's true. You will draw more spells when you have less lands in your deck. Well, a anything, in theory. Anything else we should know? That's all I got. That was my expert analysis. Got it. Got it. And Joe is going to. So I wonder how Tron is effective when you get the Mulligan and Scry. Probably makes life super <laughs> it's easy. Probably really good. Yeah. Here's the Inquisition of Kozlek. Karn. Oh, big stuff and land. Yep. I'm sorry. Karn, Warm <laughs> Coil, land. Two of which, two Tron pieces. There's a Tower, a Mine, a Ghost Quarter, and a Grove of the Burn Willows. Well, Gabriel's got information about what he's playing against. And he'll know of Joe Top Decks. Yeah, I've played, <laughs> I've played a lot of Inquisition in my day. I'm not sure my turn one Inquisition has ever whiffed. The whammy. We did have a match couple opens ago where a turn one duress whiffed and then the opponent drew all spells afterward. Like actual spells, yeah. not creatures? Yeah. Very disheartening feeling. I think I played a transgress the mind on turn four at the Pro Tour that missed, which is like not that surprising. Sure. My opponent had like two bone splinters in his hand or something. I was actually Hal Brady, uh, oh. native, native to here. He's won an open here. Won a Dallas open. Yeah, that was in the finals of our first draft, and asked him if his standard deck was good, because I knew mine wasn't. And he was like, I don't know, we'll see. But it was like this four-color Planeswalker deck. It was pretty sweet looking. All right. I think he went six and four. So he got de deck was posted and everything. Good enough. Yeah. Dark Confidant was turn number two here for Gabriel Nicholas. And Joe is going to play a Sylvan Scrying to search for the missing Tron piece. So Dark Confidant's got some work to do. 
power plant is the land that is searched for. So now Gabriel knows my opponent has Tron. He's got payoffs with Tron in Warm Coil Engine and Karn. So I better present something here that is really good in the meantime. Like a Fulminator Mage would help. That would be fantastic. Take a little reveal here. Oh, now mm -hmm. he's, he's missed his Dark Confidant trigger. Moved a little too quickly, unfortunately. Yep, and now he's pointing and saying, do I get to do this? And I believe with how the rules are articulated now, the opponent gets to choose if you get your trigger. Yes. So, Joe, would you like to put this Dark Confidant trigger on the stack? I'm guessing the answer is no. I believe the answer is no, yes. <laughs> Raging Ravine is the land for the turn Confidant will come across. Lissette will draw a copy of Ugin. So he's got the curve. He has six, seven, eight. <laughs> he does have the curve. That's the curve, yeah, right? That's, the, that's, that's why you play Tron? Yeah, it's the curve. Here's a chromatic star sphere, excuse me. Cashing it in. Trying to spike a pyroclasm here, maybe. Didn't hit. I think that's another Karn. Well, if Fulminator Mage does not come off the top here, I like Joe's spot. I like Joe's spot a lot. That he's going to be playing a lot of big stuff over the next few turns. Now, there is a Tectonic Edge in hand. That's good. So that means that if Gabriel can deal with the first big thing, he might be able to keep Joe off playing additional big things. Yes. For how long? Unclear. There's the Tech Edge. Yeah, it's tough against Tron. I mean, they basically have, like, 20 copies of each Tron piece. Yeah. You know, that's obviously an exaggeration, but there's, there's scrying, there's math, there's a lot of cantrips, there's ancient stirrings. Like, there's a lot of ways to dig through your deck. There's a Tarmogoyf. They'll check the sizing on it. Like sorcery. Artifacts. And artifacts. <laughs> so it's actually a pretty small Tarmogoyf, all things considered. Let's settle draw. Another Urza's Tower. Well, that might be the one that Gabriel goes after. Yep. Because it is, in theory, the best Tron piece. It adds the most mana. Here's Ugin, the Spirit Dragon. It will minus in a moment to exile all the creatures that are on the battlefield. I think we might see a Lightning Bolt go after Ugin. Yeah, I mean, that plus the Raging Ravine can take it out, but then you're not casting or cashing in the Tech Edge mm -hmm. for a Stone Rain. So Gabriel would really like an extra mana on this turn somehow. Or draw a Lightning Bolt. Yeah, I guess that works too. Yeah, the Dark Confidant out the draw. The tough thing here, too, is if you're Gabriel, you'd, you'd like to kill Ugin, right? You'd like to kill it with the Raging Ravine. Yeah, because it's, it's so hard to beat that card. But you also know it's in your opponent's hand from yeah. the other turn of the game. You know so, they have a card in a Warm Coil Engine. So this is the definition of a rock in a hard place. Yeah, so do you want to kill the Ugin and cut Joe off of potential car and Warm Coil Engine shenanigans? Or do you say, all right, I'm going to kill your tower and hopefully I can draw something to beat your Ugin. Yeah. And then also hopefully I can fade something, or hopefully I can fade a, a draw that finds you a Tron land. Well, he did kill the tower. Yeah, of course, because it's it's the, the quote-unquote best one, right? Little does he know Joe already has a tower, so it ends up just being the worst of all the situations for him. I think it's time for us Magic players that we go on a mission and we start killing the mine. Yeah. it's They always have the backup they tower. Are, see, look at his face. He knows. Look at that smile. Yep, of course you have the backup tower. Yeah. I wouldn't get mad if they had a backup mine, but I'm tired <laughs> of it being the backup tower. Well, I'm not tired of it because I play Tron. I love it being the backup tower. But when, I'm sure opponents are tired of it being backup tower. Or, yeah, they need to start killing the mine. Whenever I played Tron, granted, this was like blue-white Tron. You sure. Know, uh, but I definitely played the, the green-red Tron deck when it first came out. It looks sweet. Uh, but, yeah, whenever they would just be like, eh, I'll kill one of your Tron pieces. It doesn't really matter which one. Yeah, I'll kill the mine. I'd, like, look at my hand and be like, oh, I do have a mine. That's mm -hmm. sweet. I didn't think that this did anything. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it kind of made my day. So I think it's time as a community that we maybe shift towards either the power plant or the mine. Stop killing the tower because it provides the most mana. Because you know, I think the frustration level when they play the backup tower is higher because it adds more mana. If it was the backup mine, whatever. The art on the mine's ugly anyway. It's not that big of a deal. This is my theory. That's uh, just sound theorying right there. You learn that from playing a lot of Tron. <laughs> Full Mary Mage is going to go after the tower. I bet Joe's going to have another tower. Well, if not this turn, probably within the next two, mm -hmm. Ancient Stirrings comes off the top. Yep. Take a look. Top five here for Joe in just a second. 
Oblivion Stone. So it versus Power Plant. Maybe it's more random than I think. <laughs> I, I think it is exactly random. <laughs> Chromatic Star is what Joe will take on Vixen Sturing. He's got a Ghost Quarter in hand, another Tron piece, but just got a bit of a smile, and I, I would too. He's I in mean, a good spot here. If I were Joe, I'd be like, whatever, man, just kill all my lands. I have two <laughs> enormous Planeswalkers. I'm pretty sure I can take you with just these two cards. I will just not cast spells for the rest of the game. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, broker a deal. I, I promise not to tap my lands for man anymore. I won't do anything with them. Yeah, but then what do you get out of Gabriel? Nothing. <laughs> that, that's, that's not a good deal. <laughs> you are terrible at making deals. <laughs> Joe going to cash in a chromatic star. Looks like he's found a chromatic sphere. See, this is what we were talking about last game, where you just have sweats on sweats on sweats. Now, that's the best part of Tron. I know. But th this this is so anticlimactic because he already has two things in play. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He's got an active Ugin and an active Karn liberated. Gabriel could maybe beat a Karn, maybe beat an Ugin. Can't beat both. Could. Unlikely. Does have two Maelstrom Pulses in his deck. All right. Running Maelstrom Pulses. That could be the plan here for Gabriel. You know, before, a lot of people have been very vocal about their hatred of playing against Trod. I kind of get it now. I, now that I'm looking at it from a different perspective. It's a little frustrating sometimes. Okay, so so we, we figured this out for you. Now we have to work on you liking camping. Or, <laughs> no, we don't. Or, no. or at least understanding no, it. No, we don't. No. <laughs> I don't like the feeling of just being damp all the time. That's not going to change. Colagon's command the draw. I'm going to take a look at the graveyard. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a card. Very powerful. Not as powerful as Ugin. Accurate. That is a factual statement. Dark Confidant, the other card in hand. Now, even if you return a Fulminary Mage here, that's just not going to help all that much. No, I mean, the, the lands at this point are not the problem. If I'm Joe, I'm not killing the Confidant. I would kill his Confidant. I'm going to give him one trying to make some friends Cause, out here. Yeah, because you're a Tron guy and you feel bad. <laughs> trying to make some friends out here. Going to cash in the sphere. Looked like a green card. Yeah, Sylvan's crying. So Tron is back online if we want it. Yep. Looks like he's going to use the Eris as mine to help assist. Modern open players, that is time for the round. Player, Time to find the third to tower. Turns to Everything's going well here for Joe Lissette. And we'll have a Fulminator Mage here, I believe, in just a moment. Yeah, the, the trick with Tron, as you know, is you just can't ever let him get to this point. I suppose there are some decks out there that don't really care about this. Some combo decks. Yeah, in theory, you know. Like, like, for example, th this is what makes the twin matchup so bad. Like, if you're doing this against twin, twin can just still beat you. They can work their way through this, which is why that matchup is really tough. There's an expedition map. Okay. So now he has the Eye of Ugin also. Ah, okay. What do we got here? Bang. Abrupt decay. <laughs> Any responses? Yes, there will be a response. And Joe is going to search. <laughs> uh, Joe's enjoying himself now, at least. Well, both players are taking it in stride. Yeah. It's like there's kind of a game going on, except for Joe also has Ugin and Karn in play. There, that's the sub game. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Planeswalker sub Karn, game. Karn has already ultimated. Yep. And we're, there, we're just playing both games at the same time. Yeah, got a little play, Planeswalker sub game strategy. That's what's happening here. Looks like Ugin's going up. Karn, maybe think and restart, maybe not. Yeah, that's one thing that's never happened. Could be an SCG Live first. The, the Karn restart? Yeah. What is your highest amount of loyalty on Karn? I think I've gotten it to like 18 once. I think. If memory serves, I think I did like ma once on a match on Magic Online, but I just restarted instead one time. Here's a Terminate on one coil engine. 
Restarting is like kind of cool. And for some reason, you just get to go first. I'm not entirely sure why. There's no die roll. You just get to go first. Okay. Kind of makes sense. Does it? Why do it, I get to go first? It's a Planeswalker ultimate. Why, why would you restart the game off your ultimate and then go second? I guess. I think you should have to roll the die. Bloodstained Mire and extension of the hand. Jolisette's going to win this match here over Gabriel Nicholas. Two games to one. Green Red Tron will take care of Jund. Jolisette is six and three. He will be in a day two of competition. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find that apology soon here. Joe <laughs> thinking that we were trying to set him up in some sort of matchup he couldn't win. The pairings are random, man. The pairings are random. He did lose game one. That's true. That's true. Jund, a very, uh, very good matchup for Green and Tron. Part of the reason you play the deck. You have a really good matchup against the black-green decks, so that's a nice appeal to it. But the, the thing about Tron is you're, the matchups that are good, they're fantastic. The matchups that are bad are pretty gosh darn bad. Yeah, you have very polarizing matchups, right? Like yeah. a lot of 80-20s and 20-80s. Yeah. There's really no, and there's really no in-between. And I, Jund is all 45-55. Yeah, it just, I guess it depends on what you're more comfortable with. Because you know, with Tron, there you don't really get to... I don't really get to leverage your skill very much. Not a ton. I mean, yeah. like the sequencing, like your order of 